Hi, I'm Corey Franklin, and this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight, we're going to start out with Salustiano Sanchez Blasquez, who died at the age of 112. He is, or at least he was, the oldest living man in the world. We recently did Germán Kimura, who died at the age of 116 and gave his title to Mr. Blasquez. And this looks like it's going to be a recurring feature on this podcast. Here's a report on Salustiano Sanchez Blasquez. The world's oldest man has died at the age of 112. Guinness World Records says Salustiano Sanchez Blasquez passed away Friday at a nursing home in New York. Blasquez, nicknamed Shorty, was born in Spain in June 1901 and moved to the United States in 1920. He was known for his musical talent on the dulzaina, a double reed wind instrument, and he worked as a coal miner in Kentucky before he moved to Niagara Falls, New York to work in construction. He married his wife Pearl in 1934 and the couple had two children. Blasquez became the world's oldest man after Jeremin Kimura died on June 12th at the age of 116. Blasquez told Guinness World Records he didn't feel like he accomplished anything special by taking the title, but was humbled by the attention. He also credited his longevity to eating one banana per day, as well as taking six mild pain relief tablets daily. He leaves behind a daughter, seven grandchildren, 15 great-grandchildren, and five great-great-grandchildren. The world's oldest person is from Japan, a woman called Miso Okawa. She's 115. Yeah, look for Miso coming up on this show pretty soon. Every time one of the oldest people in the world dies, they always give the advice they had on how they lived so long. You could probably put together a pretty interesting book just collecting all the advice from all those old bits of those people. We're going to move on now to Rick Caceres, who died at the age of 82. And Rick Caceres was the great running back for the Chicago Bears in the late 50s and early 60s. He was their star before Gail Sayers. I saw Rick Caceres play a number of times. He was number 35. He could do everything. He could run, he could catch, and he could block. He had over 5,000 yards rushing. He was the Bears' leading rusher ever until Walter Payton. And he was a tough guy who was a pleasure to watch. You'd see him at Wrigley Field on that turf and it'd take three Packers or three Lions or three Colts to bring him down. He should have had an even better career, but George Hallis minimized his use in later seasons and he criticized Hallis publicly. He was one of the first players to criticize Hallis. Later on, a number of players went on to criticize Hallis, saying he valued the system over their individual talents. Casera said he could have had 10,000 yards, and I think that's true. Here's a report from Tampa Bay on Rick Caceres. He's been called the greatest athlete to ever come out of the Tampa Bay area. One of the greatest athletes to ever come out of the Tampa Bay area has died. And now an effort is underway to memorialize him at his local high school. A spectacular player in multiple sports and a hero in the Cuban community, Rick Caceres died Friday after battling several illnesses. Tonight, our Chris Trankman looks back at the storied career of a Bay Area legend. Fullback Rick Caceres, number 35, became pro football's toughest guy on the block. He was our very own living, breathing Jim Thorpe. You know, we never got to meet Babe Ruth, but he was as big as Babe Ruth uh, to those of us that grew up here. A good straight arm enabled Caceres to go the distance on a brilliant 81-yard touchdown run. From 1955 to 1966, Rick Caceres played in the NFL at a high level, reaching the Pro Bowl five times leading the league in rushing and touchdowns in 1956 and winning a championship in 1963. He was the all-time leading rusher for the Chicago Bears, and his records weren't broken until some guy named uh, Walter Payton came around some 30 years later. Football legends like Mike Ditka led a failed effort to get Caceres into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I idolized him because he was a tough guy that didn't wear it outside. He did everything by example. I saw the guy try to play a game with a broken ankle. And and it it was broken. But it's his accomplishments at Jefferson High School in Tampa and as a Florida Gator that make him one of the state's all-time best athletes, not only in football, but basketball and track and field. So one day at track practice, they said, Rick, we need somebody to throw the javelin. He picked it up, and he threw it out of the stadium figuratively, set a state record. Friends hoped Caceres would live to see his name placed on the Jefferson High School fieldhouse but he passed away Friday at the age of 82. He was arguably Hillsborough County's greatest athlete. In the day since Caceres died, friends and family have already gathered hundreds of signatures urging his alma mater to memorialize him at the Jefferson High School Fieldhouse. Just want to mention in passing that Rick Caceres was a longtime teammate on the Bears of Harlan Hill, 
we did on a podcast a couple of months back. We're going to close tonight with David Frost, Sir David Frost, who died at the age of 74, and he was a creature of television. He didn't really have any skills except for the fact he had an ingratiating personality, and that allowed him to interview basically everybody, eight British prime ministers and seven United States presidents and everyone else in sports, politics, and show business. How do you describe him? Well, as I said, without television, you probably wouldn't know who he was. He was sort of a cross between Ed Sullivan, Johnny Carson, Mike Wallace, and Barbara Walters. He had a better sense of humor than Ed Sullivan. He was nicer than Mike Wallace. He was a better interviewer than Johnny Carson, and he was smarter than Barbara Walters. This added up to a guy who could get people on his television shows and occasionally get them to reveal secrets. Here's the Daily Mail on David Frost. Veteran broadcaster Sir David Frost has died at the age of 74. Internationally, he will be remembered for his revealing interviews with former U.S. President Richard Nixon. If I try and rob a bank and fail, that's no defense. I still tried to rob a bank. I did not have a corrupt motive. More than 50 years as a television star, Sir David's career spanned journalism, comedy writing and daytime presenting. Many have already paid their tributes, including the Prime Minister. My heart goes out to David Frost's family. He could be and certainly was with me, both a friend and a fearsome interviewer. I don't know about fearsome. He may have had the occasional zinger, got an occasional revelation, but I think that may be Cameron speaking while well, the dead. While David Frost didn't have much of a flair for comedy, he started out on the great British television news satire show. That was the week that was in 1962-1963. A headline on the front page of the Sunday Telegraph, Mosley Appeals to Churches. Nice pinky appeals to somebody. That was the week that was, was the groundbreaking show that led the way for all the other political satire shows. But it didn't last very long, and that might have been the end of David Frost's career as a failed satirist. But he picked up some chat shows, came to America, did a couple of Johnny Carsons, and then became known as an interviewer. His career was made when he used his engaging personality to get Richard Nixon to talk about his resignation from the presidency. This was shown all over the world and made Frost a household name. Here are some of the excerpts. I let the American people down, and I have to carry that burden with me for the rest of my life. You got caught up in something, yeah. and then it snowballed. It's my fault. I'm not blaming anybody else. Now, reading as you've requested yes, all right, the, fine. the whole context. Let me, let me just stop that you right is, there. I want to say right here and now, I said things that were not true. What did Haldeman tell you? during the 18 and a half minute gap. There was no cover up of any criminal activity. That is obstruction of justice. Uh, just a moment, Period. that's your conclusion. I did not commit, in my view, an impeachable offense. I was concerned about whether or not the other side was bugging us. I cut off one arm and cut off the other. No, I don't interpret that that way I at all. I can't recall that conversation. I said things that were not I true. Don't Why didn't you stop it? I gave them a sword and they stuck it in they twisted it with relish. Here's Frost commenting on Nixon. There's a famous story. Nixon was trying to make small talk before one of the interviews, so he asked Frost if he did any fornicating that weekend, just showed how ill at ease Nixon was on a personal basis with people. The thing that comes back to me as I look at this footage again and again is that, that barrier he had between him and people, you know. One of the reasons he wasn't in touch with what people were thinking was that he, he didn't like going out of his way to meet people because he, he was awkward with people and uh, and that awkwardness and that clumsiness was one of the things that probably closed him off from knowing what the public were really thinking and so it's those sort of personal flaws that come through I think. Getting the insight into Nixon was probably the highlight of Frost's career as an interviewer but he did have a couple of other interesting interviews. Here he is with Paul McCartney right after they came back from America in 1964 and had just finished filming A Hard Day's Night. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul McCartney. Paul, it's, it's great to have you here, and uh, one thing as we've been rehearsing today that I've been wondering is that you ever expected things to be as good for you as in fact they've been. When you started as a group, did you expect things to go like this? Did well, you? we used to sort of think of things in stages, still do I think. Yeah. When, we, <clears throat> when we first started off you know, playing in the camp on things, I thought, first of all, let's get a record contract, we all did. We got a record contract, we said, let's get a number one hit, got one of them. <laughs> you know, and uh, so I hear you. went on. It, we, you know, we do it in stages, so we never but thought... You, after you've got a number mistake. one hit, you hope for another number one hit. Did you yeah. have them one? Something like the Royal Variety performance. And Something then, sort of big, and then it came after that. America, I think. Yeah, which was marvellous. And after America, the film. Now, it's fairly close to the film being as big a success as everything else, I should think. 
Now, if it is in sort of a bit later this year, a big success, yeah. what will be the next ambition then? I don't know. Uh, another film, probably. And what about after that? Oh, don't ask me. You know, I don't know. doing it. <laughs> Of course, everybody, I imagine, says to you, the pop world is very short-lived and everything mm. like that. And uh, what will you do when the phase passes? Do you think the phase will pass? Does it worry you? No. Yeah, I, I couldn't care less, really. I don't, I don't think no, it would be flop tomorrow. It would be, be sad, you know. But, I mean, it wouldn't really worry me. Would, could you go back to doing something else? Oh, I don't know. I'd, I'd miss doing this. Anything doing completely, different? completely different? Completely different. Uh, retire, you know. That, that, that's yeah. Yeah. Well, it'll be, thank you very much. It'll be a great pleasure to watch Paul McCartney in retirement, but it'll probably be in the year about 2010, I should think. Thank you. Uh, not exactly, but David Frost said his biggest hero was Muhammad Ali, and he interviewed him before the Foreman fight. What's the result of the big fight? No problem. This will be the biggest upset since Sonny Liston. Sonny Liston knocked out Patterson twice, and I was supposed to fall, but he didn't knock me out. Because he could hit hard, but he couldn't find nothing to hit. George Foreman knocked out Ken Norton, knocked out Joe Frazier. True, I didn't knock him out. But I'm so fast, I'm so hard hit, I'm so scientific. I'm a total different man from Frazier Norton. Listen, David, when I meet this man, if you think the world was surprised when Nixon resigned, wait till I whip Foreman's behind. I've done something special. I've wrestled with an alligator. <laughs> I'll tell I believe you totally. I, have, I believe you completely. I have, hey, I could play some more interviews, but I think I'll play a little bit of a Mac obituary Marty Feldman did for him in the 60s, making fun of his ego. He reached the peak of his great career when he became King David the First of England. <laughs> we shall not look upon his like again, if we play our cards right. <laughs> his death occurred early today. King David was standing in front of a gigantic mirror a present given to him by his admirers, when it fell forward on top of him. His last words to a grieving nation that give us all consolation and a hint, perhaps, of the second coming were, I'll be back in a trice. Meanwhile, here's a song from Engelbert Humperdinck. I've got to tell you one good David Frost story. One of the guys he knew, who wasn't especially fond of him, thought he was a little pompous, it was Peter Cook, who worked with him in the comedy scene in London in the early 60s. A lot of people like John Cleese think Peter Cook was the funniest guy in the post-war era, and I wouldn't argue with him. Anyway, David Frost scheduled a dinner party for some of his important friends. I think it was Princess Anne and Mark Phillips. And he called up Peter Cook, and he said, Peter, could you come to dinner on Thursday night? I'm having Princess Anne and Mark Phillips, and they're big fans of yours. They'd really like to meet you. Peter Cook says, right, David, let me check my schedule. And he, while he's on the phone, he says, Thursday night? He says, Oh, I'm sorry, I'll be busy that night. I have to watch TV. Peter Cook also thought David Frost pinched a lot of his material, so his nickname for him was the Bubonic Plagiarist. Kind of close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tapps. As I said, David Frost got his start on the great satire show, That Was the Week That Was. It had writers like John Cleese, Peter Cook, Raul Dahl, and Kenneth Tynan. It broke ground and started a lot of careers besides David Frost and actually played in America for a little while. As a final tribute to David Frost, I'm going to play the theme from That Was the Week That Was, sung by Millicent Martin. <laughs> That's it, really. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was. That was the week that was. That was. Good night.